This is three lectures in one. In the past, I've separated into three topics. The city beautiful, the industrial city, and the garden city. And uh, in order to give us more time in the 20th century, I am compressing these, what had been three different paradigms, into a single lecture, which kind of comes together as significant principles of the modern city. It also has the benefit of characterizing and, and exemplifying the three big paradigms of the course, uh, as given by Kevin Lynch. The reading for um, this interim week for your optional response next Thursday is Kevin Lynch's chapter in which he describes the three paradigms that we've been working with. The city as an organism, the city as a machine, the city as uh, an, no, City as a cosmos, city as a machine, city as an organism. The city as a cosmos is represented clearly by this idea of the city beautiful. Uh, if we start in the present moment, you can think of the whole flourishing of landscape urbanism, uh, the, the rise of landscape architecture, the importance of the environment and the synchronization of urban systems with ecological systems. This is all um, clearly uh, a manifestation of uh, these things. Um, the, the City Beautiful movement is uh, best exemplified by some of the uh, principles of the Congress for New Urbanism, which you may have heard of. Uh, but it really goes back in time to when the humans uh, started to use their eyes to organize physical arrangements. And so the power of vision lends itself to uh, ideas of visual organization of space. And so this is a stage set from the Renaissance um, that there, the stage sets uh, did a great job of exemplifying what people felt about the city. Urban space is the stage set upon which the drama of human uh, life plays out. And there was one urban stage set for the noble drama and a separate stage set for the tragic drama. And so it's a very powerful, very literal manifestation of this idea that we build our cities and then life plays out in one way or another depending on the way those cities are formed. Um, so this is the, the stage set of, from the Renaissance of that. The, um, at a much earlier time, those of you who grew up Catholic might know about um, heaven, hell, purgatory, and indulgences. Uh, my mother is, was a um, Sunday school teacher, and um, so uh, I know all about this stuff. Um, when we die... We don't go to heaven or hell straight away. We wait around in a place called purgatory. And uh, we are not judged simply on whether we, uh, on the actions, uh, on our sins, and all those things we do to get forgiven for our sins, uh, go to confession, uh, observe the sacraments, um, all of that system. So now we're talking about the system of Christianity and how it impacts cities. There was something called indulgences that the early church said, uh, your time in purgatory can be reduced if you earn indulgences. How do you earn indulgences? Well, visit a location where a relic is, is um, preserved. So uh, a piece of the, the, the thorny crown that was placed on Jesus' head when he was crucified, a piece of the cross, um, St. Matthew's sandals, the bones of St. James. These relics are preserved in churches all around the Mediterranean world. And by visiting on foot, mostly, by walking to visit these relics and being in the presence of something touched by Jesus, uh, you gain indulgences and your time in purgatory can be shortened, sometimes significantly. If you visit... Uh, on special jubilee years, the Pope would declare uh, the year 1000 is a special year. You'll get uh, a double bonus 
on your indulgences. And people went. This was the dawn of modern tourism. People traveling for reasons other than trade. Uh, and we still do it. Uh, the bucket list is a similar idea now. My sister's climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. I don't know if she thinks of it as getting indulgences, but it is like on her list and she's doing it. So it's that kind of instinct. So when uh, the pilgrims were scheduled to make a pilgrimage on a jubilee year to Rome, uh, to make it easier, Pope Sixtus V said, we're going to charge the urban fabric of Rome by connecting the pilgrimage sites uh, the different destinations within the city of Rome with straight avenues and boulevards so that the pilgrims can come into the gate of the city, visit one, and then coming out of that, they can see the next one, they visit the next one. And there were pilgrimage routes that crisscrossed all of Europe, uh, and then those pilgrimage routes converged on cities and they manifested in something like this. And so this is Rome, um, the uh, Piazza del Popolo here, and the three axes that lead you to significant landmarks. Um, here's St. Paul's. Uh, no. That's London. St. John's. No, St. Peter's. Get my apostles right. <coughs> Sorry, Mom. Um, and so these, this network of boulevards marked the significant pilgrimage locations. And it was a way that the city could, yet another example from this course, of how the city, the form of the city is an instrument for creating a certain uh, outcome that is not just economic, it is spiritual in this case, uh, it's cultural, it's a reinforcing of the precepts of the religion. Here we are. Uh, in the forecourt of St. Peter's in Rome, the Vatican, uh, for a gathering uh, at which the Pope appears on the balcony, not so different from um, President Obama's inauguration. Uh, here, employing the architectural tricks of uh, forced perspective, where um, the Pope appears to be larger than life and further away because of the false divergence of the walls. You see that? <coughs> um, Paris, let's go to Paris. One of the greatest examples uh, we have of this tendency is Paris. Um, who's seen the movie Les Miserables? What? Just never mind, OK? Did I mention it? Hugh Jackman? Wolverine? <laughs> It's still out there. OK, don't do any homework. Just go see. No, <laughs> I, I didn't say that. So, um, so the word Les Miserables comes from the conditions of Paris. It was miserable. <coughs> it was not fun. Talk about um, learning the lesson the hard way. Do not shit where you eat. This was the hard lesson of Paris in this time. Revolution, revolt, um, the barricades, the dead. This is almost a direct quote from uh, Les Miserables. This is a depiction of the cramped streets that developed in Paris up through the, the 18th uh, century. Um, some streets had been cut. Uh, you can see the imprint of the original walls when it was a Roman settlement. See that? One of the ways you can see that is where the gate, the gates and the walls at the corners uh, lead to some radiating streets. So it's an example. Uh, you can often find, as mentioned in the Roman section of the uh, Sidious Machine Lecture, that uh, where the streets suddenly branch off, you can, you can be pretty sure there was a gate there. So that was an organic formation. Uh, you get to the gate of the city, and you go to this village, that village, or that village, and so there are three roads going in. They later become streets, and that is one way that diagonals get <coughs> formed. Another way diagonals get formed is uh, Napoleon III, uh, in trying to uh, keep the insurrections at bay, 
it's easy to build a barricade across a narrow street. It's much harder to build a barricade across a wide street. It is difficult to move troops through narrow streets. It is easy to move troops through wide streets. Um, another phenomenon was cholera epidemics. Cholera would, uh, would happen in cities uh, throughout the 18th and 19th centuries. And it wouldn't just kill uh, some people. It wouldn't be like flu season. It would kill 30,000 people. And um, throughout history, diseases that killed 30,000 people, no big deal, as long as they were poor people. But cholera did not just kill poor people. The poor and the rich lived in the same city and cholera would spread and kill rich people. And so it had, there had to be something done about it. So here's Baron Eugene uh, von Haussmann, who was Napoleon III's, let's call him the architect, the architect planner, uh, financier. He did all these things. And he said, here's what we should do. We should do what Pope Sixtus V did uh, for the Jubilee year in Rome. Let's cut some boulevards. Um, and here's what, in this one design move, this is how space will act as an instrument for transforming Paris. Uh, and there's a connection between space and finance. Uh, let's cut these boulevards through the slums of Paris. It will displace poor people to the outer, to the outskirts of town because we're going to tear down their homes. It will create wide boulevards so we can move our troops. It will create wide boulevards so that barricades are difficult to construct. It will bring air and light into the city, which is what we thought at the time uh, the lack of air and light was the cause of cholera. Um, what did we know? And so we're going to do all those things in one move by cutting these boulevards. But but Baron von Haussmann, how can we afford this? We just fought a war. Uh, we can't tax the people. We'll, we'll, we'll spark an insurrection. Aha. Let's invent uh, deficit spending. Let's borrow money and pay it off over the decades that follow. Brilliant. And while you're at it, if there's a, boule if there's a boulevard that's going to be formed here, Invest in, buy up the land along the boulevard uh, because you can get it cheap now because no one knows it's about to be bulldozed. And after the boulevard is there, it will be worth 10, 20 times as much. You'll make a killing. So the inner circle became extremely wealthy. One of the motivators of this was wealth. Uh, it also did all those things. Here's another view of it. It did all those things um, that Hausman uh, said it would do. The old Paris, the new Paris, um, and this is the Paris that we know today. When we think of Paris, it's Hausmann's Paris. It's the grand boulevards, it's the grand buildings. Here's an example of um, a student analysis. Zoomed way out too far, but uh, useful for organizing some of the Ideas, this is where the Eiffel Tower is. So there's a view corridor to the Eiffel Tower. Um, these axial streets, the boulevards. Um, and we're going to visit a few of these spots um, in Paris. Here's a depiction of the slums being removed uh, to make way for the Grand Boulevard. Churches were preserved as much as possible. And this is the result. Notice, foreground, human bodies, we can project ourselves into the experience of this space. It's not exactly precise, but the intention is to give us spatial experience. It also captures the larger urban pattern of Paris. Uh, these internal marketplaces, um, again, the Champs-Élysées um, and the grand architecture. So there was a coupling of these wide boulevards and the architecture that goes with it. <coughs> And then together, it created a new experience of urban space that uh, really swept and continues to sweep through the world. Um, the apartment buildings that line the boulevards, uh, the kitchen uh, is on the ground floor. So this is like the service space. And then there's the piano nobile, which is Italian for the grand 
uh, level. So this is where the formal parlors and dining rooms, and this is where the wealthy uh, had their public rooms. And then above that, um, and uh, above that would be uh, less people of less means. So this is an apartment building that is a social condenser. It mixes all classes. The servants, the very wealthy, um, the, the middle class, here we have the husband and wife um, and grandma and the kids, and then we have uh, the working class, um, you must pay the rent, and then you have the very poor and the artists. And so it's a social stratification uh, in the apartment buildings that lined the grand boulevards of Paris. Looks like it's just a photo, um, but it's actually a subtly colored um, analysis that gives us a sense of how these apartment buildings create the boulevard space. And the formula is a uniform facade with cornices, with tops, bottoms, and shafts in the classical uh, sense, um, a streetscape of a wide boulevard, tree-lined streets, wide sidewalks, and it created a new social life on the streets. Strolling was the entertainment. Uh, you get dressed up in your best clothes, you walk out, you are seen and you, you see and you are seen. The important thing was to be seen and to see. The department store, which was a new building type at the time, uh, was a parade ground. It was a continuation off the street and into the architecture of this parading, of this being seen and seeing other people uh, of various stratifications of the middle class, the new middle class. This was um, a new thing. Uh, the, instead of having very rich monarchs and then the peasants, there was the emergence through uh, economic development of uh, a growing middle class. And this was the architectural manifestation through building types and through spatial experience it was a boulevard, it was a spatial experience of the boulevard, and it became a spatial experience of these building types in the interior. That's why the staircase is like this. It's because this is where you parade yourself, and this is where you view um, others parading. Um, this is uh, the similar Bon Marche department store where this is occurring. It looks like some of the exposition buildings. Uh, here's another example of it. The Grand Boulevard of the Opera uh, led to the new opera house by Garnier. And here's another view of it, a student uh, analysis of the Grand Boulevards. The way the, the apartment buildings uh, create and define the space of the boulevard. And other things happen in here. But the important stage set of the city is occurring here and along these boulevards. And in this one, you start um, at one end, and you parade to the opera house. And the show continues uh, on the, in the space defined by the front facade. You enter through that front facade up the stairs, and you enter this vast complex of spaces before you even get to the opera hall house itself. This is where the audience is sitting, and that's it. This is the space of the, um, the audience, the space of performance. Uh, there was a high value to creating depth in the spatial uh, experience of the stage. So that's another uh, experience that ties back to the first slide of Serlio's stage set. But look how much is for us to parade through the sequence of spaces up on balconies uh, up the grand staircase, um, not so different from the department store, this grand display of my fine clothes uh, and to see everyone else. And then the show continues in here, and then an intermission, the show continues here, and then back out onto the boulevard. So this is a section done by a student that really combines the space of display, the stage, the audience, the display outside the hall, and the performance continues in the space of the city. Um, this is a similar thing happened on the Ringstrasse in Vienna, where they removed the medieval walls and the fields of fire and filled it with 
um, the stage set architecture uh, that was prevalent in the 19th century. Um, Washington, D.C. is a similar example of the facades of the buildings defining a, a porous screen to define the space of the mall, and then a more, a more solid screen uh, back one level. So it's a layered definition of space, where this one is porous and this one is more solid. And it builds on a tradition from Renaissance Italy. That was supposed to be shown earlier in Paris. So here we have the this, the street scene um, in, in Paris. Uh, artists love to depict this kind of social life that happens uh, on the boulevards of Paris, which was really the emergence of the modern urban experience of space that we still enjoy today on Newbury Street and Fifth Avenue in New York. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the industrial city and all its woes. The response in the United States to uh, back, coming back to Chicago and the slaughterhouses, there was vast wealth in Chicago because of its effectiveness as a machine. But it was always considered a second-class citizen to uh, places like New York. And so to correct that, the 1893 Columbian Exposition um, got several architects from Boston, uh, namely Daniel Burnham, uh, to develop an American version of Haussmann's Paris, building on this idea. Um, and so you have the displays of all the grand constructions uh, of industry, but presented in the, um, the, re, the redesigned fabric of Chicago. And I guess that's, and this became a movement. This is the birthplace of the City Beautiful movement. It spread throughout uh, pretty much every city in the United States. Here's Cleveland, uh, San Francisco's civic district. Um, Boston has the MFA and Copley Square. Uh, but basically, every city in the United States has some aspect of the City Beautiful movement. Uh, it also went overseas to the colonies. Uh, the colonial world is filled with examples of the City Beautiful movement if you're looking for something to analyze. Uh, good candidates exist in French, colonial French uh, Southeast Asia, Hanoi, Saigon, which is now um, Ho Chi Minh City, uh, Manila, uh, other examples of the colonies um, exist. Now here's um, a young architect, uh, who architecture student, who didn't do so well in school, but went on. He, he basically dropped out of architecture school, but went on to be um, what some of us believe uh, to be the, the most influential, one of the most influential designers of the 20th century. Um, a young man by the name of Adolf Hitler uh, used architecture as an instrument for power. He used the imagery of classical Greece uh, and, uh, to, and these ceremonies that were grand displays of power, uh, assembling and choreographing these vast displays of power. He designed the uniforms. He designed the flag. He designed, he had a, a, an important role in the design of these Greek Roman uh, constructions. The whole goal was to say, Rome fell to the, uh, the barbarian hordes. And it is our job, the superior Germanic uh, people, to reestablish the empire uh, that will reign for a 1,000 years. And this is the physical fabric by which we assert our power um, and establish our reign. When he was found uh, dead in the bunker at the end of World War II, uh, his bunker was connected by a tunnel to a room that contained this model. Even to the very end, it was the architectural model of the city of Berlin that meant so much to him. And there he is um, directing his design team, uh, developing some of the largest uh, uh, domes and vaults ever, uh, 
ever intended for construction. Uh, no, it wasn't that high. It was big. It wasn't anywhere near like that. The Vauxhall. Yeah, that's what we were just saying. And um, he used light to create these appearance of infinite columns. And here, um, the last slide of the City Beautiful thing is really uh, at the International Exposition of 1937. You have um, Lenin, or, or this is the Soviet and the, and the German pavilions uh, kind of flanking each other um, uh, in a display of power using these axial forces. I'm going to continue a bit, but I will really do the flip because I'm going to record the rest of the mo most of what's left um, and put it on the internet. Um, but uh, I will continue here um, a bit. Uh, we go to London and the Fire of London of 1666 and the competition for the reconstruction of London. Again, you can see the Roman, the original Roman settlement is imprinted in the street pattern and it was located where the Thames River was um, most easily crossed. And so for trade and military purposes, that's where you establish the original settlement. And when the Romans come, that's where they establish their Roman town, the Sicardo and Decumanus. Um, after the fire, there's uh, a design competition that is an interesting documentation of all the ideas of what, how cities should be formed in the late 17th century. And so you see a lot of the ideas of the axial city beautiful, um, but in the end, they really had to respect all the infrastructures that were embedded in the ground plane. So um, St. Paul's Cathedral uh, and this view, again, the foreground, spatial experience, the pastoral in relationship to the urban, the dominance of the church spires uh, in the larger urban system. So foreground, background is conveying a very important message about the piety of the city at that time. The industrial infrastructure that comes in uh, to England uh, with the Industrial Revolution was paired with the drive to take people off of the landscape. Uh, the laws of enclosure were progressing over several centuries to push peasant farmers off of the land. They did not have full title ownership of the land, and the laws were passed to push them off their land, and so they could only farm it as tenant farmers and get a much smaller piece of the cut. And so they were driven off the land and into cities uh, and to work in factories. The factories would locate wherever a river would drop and a short horizontal space wherever there was a high vertical drop. That was true here too. Um, Lowell, Lawrence, Nashua, Manchester, Providence, Worcester, all of these towns formed. Um, and there was a, a polemical uh, view of the city by Pugin that said the uh, Gothic city was a noble place, it was the city that was pious and governed by the social principles of Christianity, and it was a healthy social fabric. But with the coming of industrialism, we have the penitentiary, we have the poorhouse, we have all of these institutions dominated by factories, cloaking the, uh, the, the smokestacks are now competing with the church steeples and kind of pushing out Christianity and high social values in the pursuit of industrial production. Uh, and so the landscape that is created uh, is extremely uh, negative. Uh, you have the soot that settles on everything. Uh, you can't put your clothes out to dry without them turning black. 
from the coal dust that settles out of the air from the steam locomotives. Uh, because you don't have cars uh, or any other way of getting around, you have to live very close to the factories. And so land was extremely precious. And so you had to live at very high densities. And these slums were cloaked from view by um, the streets. Here we see uh, the industrial fabric, the canal that brought the water from behind the dam to drop it through pipes and power the factories originally. And then later, the rail lines that came through to um, deliver things to and from, housing in close proximity, and then the later development of retail, and then the decimation of everything in order to create enough parking. Often, the trace of the rail line persists in the fabric, even after the rail lines have been usurped by truck delivery. Um, and so it's a very negative situation. I want to just show um, this image that goes with the reading that you'll have for two weeks from now. Frederick Ingalls, who, with his co-author, Karl Marx, uh, initiated the thing we call socialism and later communism. Uh, a lot of this thinking was sparked by the physical fabric of the city. And so the thing you will be reading is uh, young Friedrich Engels, at the age of 23, goes off to work in his father's factory and is very disturbed by what he finds. He finds that the, the poverty uh, of the inner block is cloaked by a mask, a thin mask of wealth in the retail establishments along the streets. And so this is a, uh, a, an analysis, a very famous analysis, that is, starts out as an urban, spatial, formal analysis and leads to uh, communism in the 20th century. So I'm going to pause there. And the, this recording will get longer as you find it on the internet, because I'm going to continue uh, in my home studio. Thank you. <laughs>